Okay, welcome back from lunch. Now we will be speaking about Web3 JS 1.0, which is a major refactor from the early version, which uh, was around for the last two years. Shortly about myself, um, I'm Fabian Vogelsteller. I um, built the initially Ethereum wallet, uh, the Mist browser, and worked on Web3.js since yeah, two and a half years, roughly. Uh, built a few other things. Also initiated the ERC20 token standard uh, together with Vitalik and did a lot of other smaller things in the space. So Web3.js. Web3.js is basically a library, JavaScript library, which allows you to interact with your Ethereum node. Normally, as a JavaScript developer, you don't want to deal with low-level API uh, decoding, encoding. Um, you want to basically have a nice JavaScript object which you can interact with and easily write your applications. And Web3.js is exactly this kind of middleware. It's r widely used and actually uh, the core piece of a lot of different libraries built on top. And uh, working for two years on it, and uh, it, it grew over time, I found it very necessary to do a overhaul, so to say. It was initially created by Jeff, Jeffrey Wilke, uh, the Go Ethereum founder, uh, core developer. And uh, Marek Kotovic uh, worked later on it. I joined in 2015 working on it since then, and we have also a lot of contributors. And there's a lot more than <laughs> on this list here. So it started out uh, in 2015, uh, grew quite a lot, and uh, now restructured a lot in the 1.0 refactor. So how exactly the Ethereum communication to applications work, right? The Ethereum node itself, and the EVM especially, only understands bytecode. Bytecode is not necessarily easy to work with for most application developers. And everything which goes into the EVM has to be first translated to the bytecode to be able to be executed. So for example, this happens over the JSON RPC uh, API, which is a low level JSON API, where you have to send all of your requests and this has to be pre-encoded to be understood by the EVM. And this is exactly what Web3 JS does. For example, if you look at this example here, if you want to call a function in the EVM, for example, we want to call the transfer function with two par parameters on a contract, we would have to translate this by um, hashing the function, including its parameter types, and then taking the first four bytes of that as the function name, and then appending the other parameters after that. Web3.js is exactly like taking care of that, so you don't have to do it, and you can easily conveniently work with JavaScript objects. And the 1.0 refactor is actually a major overhaul uh, to make that even more convenient and even more intuitive and uh, give you a lot more features and tools so that you can care building about your application rather than thinking about um, how to encode what and what kind of... Uh, how to watch for your transactions and building all of that logic for yourself. So I hope that 1.0 fulfills all of that needs and is kind of the dev developer's best friend. <laughs> so the 1.0 refactor is a major refactor in the sense that I restructured a lot of the, the tools. Everything before was on the major object kind of like dispersed this way, and now we restructured it in, in proper elements. Utility functions are, for example, under the utility objects. And all of these packages are also separate packages. So you can load either the ones you need, or you can load it all together in the umbrella package. So I will now go through all of these uh, packages separately and show a little bit of what it has and what new uh, features they have. One obviously very important piece in this is that we now have promises. <laughs> Something which was 
something which probably took way too long. Um, this is all due to the way how it grew over time, and we all had to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, initially, think, thinking also that the connection to Node will be way faster and way more smoothly than it actually is with like large uh, network th which we grew today to. Basically, promises allow you simply to uh, chain your functions, which makes it more convenient and more easy to to use and to see. But we have a special case in Web three JS and especially with blockchains, we have the case that you have an event which is not necessarily final, so it cannot really come with one result only. Especially when you send a transaction, there's the possibility that you can, uh, you get a transaction hash, but you're also able to get the receipt, and there's also a lot of other things you have to take care of. For example, the chain can reorganize for a certain amount of blocks with a likelihood, so you have to take care of all of these things yourself. So when you just use the promise, for example, you get the receipt, which is what most de developers want. They want to simply send a transaction and act once they're mined. But in most cases, you actually want to have a more complex and more detailed response to your, uh, to your transactions. Maybe you want to wait for five confirmations. Uh, maybe you want to actually do something with the transaction hash directly. So this prom event construct basically allows you to uh, get all of these different types you can get back from one transaction and do something related to it. So it, it can be a promise, but it, it can also be an event uh, where you can wait for a transaction hash, receive confirmation, and we can even add a lot more in the future. Web3.js 1.0 has subscription, and this is something I worked on quite long, and it always takes a bit of time to convince many parties to do something uh, a new or different or a certain way. And subscriptions are important because we have a lot of events coming from the node. And the old way of doing that is that your application is polling that node. That works quite fairly well if you have one application and you poll for a few events, but it doesn't really work well if you have many applications polling on the same node. So subscription basically allows you exactly this pops up model where you can uh, wait for events and you have to do nothing best but waiting until it happens. This reduces a lot the resource load you have in the node and this also uh, improves the, the processing you need to do on your node itself, uh, on your application itself. So IPC sockets is basically the local socket you have when your node is running locally and web sockets is when you would uh, you talk to a remote node. The HTTP still works as well, but for subscription it can't work. There we are thinking about uh, using also some kind of polling again, but ideally you make it work with WebSockets or you actually uh, have a local node running directly. So for example, a subscription could be uh, logs or pending transactions or um, if your node is syncing or not. The advantage of that over the previous uh, way how we did it is that it's a lot more intuitive and a lot more clean. Right now you can basically subscribe for information, which is a pattern most people understand. Before we had like filters and watch and get watch, and which was very un unclear of what it even means. Now everything is under the subscribe namespace and it's pretty clear that this will be an event you're, you retrieve. But also here we have special cases that in some, some cases you can have an event which actually can change. For example, you can have an event coming from a smart contract and it might be different uh, after chain organization. So that's why we also here need this kind of pattern that we are able to uh, wait for it, the data, the actual event, or we are also able to wait for the changed event. So we can reverse that in our DAP and we can uh, apply the new, the new log, which might look different. It might have different results. The way smart contracts are in initiated in the new Web3 1.0 is more uh, the way we would expect it when we actually initiate a, in a class object. So you have to use the new keyboard, a keyword and you have to give it a JSON interface. This way you instantiate the object and you can give it an address optional or additional options. Therefore, also the options are in a separate options object, so you can easily see what are the current settings of your contract object. 
also to note here is that all the addresses returned from Web3.js are now checksum addresses. You cannot see this here in this example, but um, uh, actually you can see the from. It has an uppercase D, for example, uppercase F. So when you use an address and you pass it in, uh, you send it into any kind of function in Web3.js, it will check the checksum, and if the checksum is invalid, it will fail. If you pass in a lowercase address, it would just accept it as is because it cannot check the checksum. Now, in the smart contract object itself, all the methods and all the events are separated in its own namespace. This helps with uh, things like where you have an event maybe called the same way than a native event on the smart contract object. And when you call that event, it gives you back a object with multiple actions you can now do with that function. So for example, if I call this do something, I get an object back where I can also later even change the arguments, or I can decide to, do I call that on my node? Do I send the transaction off to the node to be mined in the network? Or if I just want to estimate the gas of this transaction, or I maybe just want to encode the ABI to be used in, as a parameter in another function. And also here we have the ability to add even more if we need to in the future and extend whatever the, uh, method, the, the methods of a smart contract can do. So if you, for example, call that, it would look like this. You call the method on the methods namespace, you paste in the parameters, and as we also now paste only parameters of the smart contract, function in the parameter space, we are also in the future able to allow structs, which we are working on right now. Before, the struct was always meant as the transaction object, so there was a bit of a confusion. And if you then want to send it, you give it the, uh, the options object of the send transaction, for example. For example, if you then uh, get this back and you wait for the receipt, or you just like resolve the promise, you would get back the receipt and it would be decoded uh, parameters also the raw data and everything else you need. So this structure is a lot more clean and a lot more accessible than it was before. Same here if you have an event. So if you have an event, it's under the namespace events. Uh, you could have an additional options that you want to filter for specific events. For example, you could say I only want to have events which matches the my index parameter with the value 20 and 30 and my other uh, index parameter has to have an address, so and so, uh, and it would then only retrieve you these events matching that, and you would get them basically once they're happening. And this is under the hood using, for example, subscriptions, which right now doesn't work for HTTP, so we have to add the polling here. Web3 is accounts, that's actually a complete new thing because web 3 accounts allows you to actually generate accounts and sign data, uh, sign transactions, encrypt these accounts, decrypt these accounts, import key store accounts, and basically gives you all the tools you need if you want to interact with a uh, public key, private key account. And having these signing functions in uh, web 3 js directly allows us to do a lot more uh, what you before would have to do with multiple libraries. A note here, this is still in beta. There's no audit run on that, so use it at your own risk. <laughs> um, we will ideally have an audit on that, and um, then it's probably more safe to use. We have uh, ABI directly, ABI encoding and decoding functions. I think this is very important because you are able now to like encode your a own ABI uh, calls, uh, decode them, and you have all of this was, was, which was before in Web3.js internal, exposed and ni nicely named and so on. It even can decode your whole lock automatically. We have now the new Swarm API as well, so you're able to interact with Swarm. Swarm works a little bit different than the uh, Ethereum node, so the provider is different. It doesn't use this, the IPC connection. You can either use uh, directly HTTP or it connects to your local Swarm node, which opens a uh, local host 8.5 something. 
uh, endpoint. And this basically allows you to upload files, download files, and even opens a file picker where you can file pick. So if you're in the browser, you can pick your files and upload them to Swarm directly, and you get the hash back to interoperate with it. Um, Whisper is currently the Whisper version 5 API in Web3.js. There's right now a discussion about refactoring to version 6, which will also be supported by Parity. The current version 5 is basically in the old Web3.js and as well in the new one, and you can play around with it and uh, experiment. And the utils function. Obviously, there's a lot of extra utility uh, tools you can use. Um, there's a lot of, of things you would use as a, um, a de dev developer, especially here. Things to check, for example, for cham check some addresses, encoding and decoding uh, to a certain extent, especially from UTF-8, um, converting numbers. And internally right now, we are using always a DBN library, but when it returns a number, it returns the number as a plain string so that you can actually use whatever library you want to interact with large numbers. And it's also, for debugging reasons, a lot easier to see the number rather than a big number object. And very important probably also, uh, you're able to hash exactly the way Solidity hashes. So this allows you to basically generate some hash and then knowing that the smart contract itself would come to the same hash. So this is tightly packing the arguments. There are multiple ways of how you can do that. You can use the auto detection, which is probably not very safe for things like numbers, which simply convert to you in 256. It's easy. Uh, uh, a string would be converted right from um, a UTF-8. And uh, obviously, bytes would be bytes. Uh, thir byte 32 right now, I think. But you can also give it an object and tell it the exact type. So you, this can be V and T, but it can also be value and type. And you can uh, basically tell them, hey, this is my arguments, this is the type of the arguments, and then uh, hash them. Yeah, here this is the longer version. And this is another version. <laughs> so yeah, actually it, it works right now. Um, I think for the reason how NPM works, it will right now by default install the better version which is probably not very wanted, but this is uh, the fault of NPM, I guess. And there's a extended documentation now, um, which is a major improvement to the documentation we have before. Basically, all the functions are documented, and they're all with examples and everything. So go to read the docs. Right now, you have to go to the uh, 1.0 branch if you want to see the 1.0 documentation. The old one, the old branch doesn't have any. So go to EN 1.0 and you can read the docs and that's the end there. Yeah.